So good afternoon. My name is Christian Blucher. I'm a neuroscientist and neurologist at the University of Geneva in Switzerland and member, member of the program committee. It's now a pleasure and honor to introduce Viviana Gradinaru as today's speaker of the special lecture. Viviana initially studied physics in Bucharest uh, in Romania. And after two years, she moved to the California Institute of Technology, where she then continued with biology and graduated in 2005. She then went up north and worked for about seven years with Carl Dyseroth in Stanford, and then moved back to Caltech, where she became an assistant professor and where she still works as now as a full professor. So, Viviana didn't have to travel far to attend the meeting, but her scientific achievements have already made much headway. She developed groundbreaking technology to, for brain imaging, refining optogenetics, as well as tissue clearing methods, and to study reward, sleep, and or Parkinson's disease. And so in today's lecture, she will update us on exciting technology for gene delivery across the blood-brain barrier for precise non-invasive study and repair of the nervous system. One last thing before we get started. So please put your phones on silent mode, but use them to ask questions on the SFN app um, there are already several questions that we have received. I will be monitoring them and then animate the Q&A at the end of her talk. So now, Viviana, please join me on stage to deliver the special lecture. Thank you. So good to be back in San Diego and to be back in almost full format for SFN. And it is my pleasure today to tell you about the work we've been doing with my lab members at Caltech, engineers and neuroscientists and collaborators. So in in Caltech, the, the lab, we try to focus on barriers that we can do something about. And one of them has been the blood-brain barrier. And this was motivated, actually, by, as Christian mentioned, by my graduate work with Carl Dysrot in optogenetics, and also the starting of tissue clearing. Because for both of these methods, you absolutely need to get transgenes to the circuits in need. And this is what motivated a lot of the delivery around engineering gene vectors for crossing the blood-brain barrier. The scientific motivation for these technologies has been ever since undergrad neurodegeneration, with a focus on Parkinson, where I try to understand it both from a circuit perspective and molecular perspective. So I hope today I can share with you some of our technologies and also the way we try to apply them for understanding and trying to improve the outcome for neurodegenerating brains. Before pursuing, I do want to mention that um, senior lab members co-founded, based on these technologies, a gene therapy company that I'm on the board and scientific guidance, and also many of the technologies developed over the years as a graduate student and afterwards with my lab have been uh, licensed to either public companies or startups. And these technologies are the basis of some of the projects that I will present today. However, before we dive into the error bars and data and control experiments, I want to take a few minutes to pause from the speed of life and from the need of doing more to remember not only what was done, but who enabled us to do that along the way. And I am eternally grateful to Dr. Paul Patterson. And I want to pause and thank and remind that we need to thank people that helped along the way before it's too late. So Paul has been a phenomenal immunologist and neuroscientist, doing work at Harvard and then at Caltech. And I lucked out to work in his lab as an undergraduate student for two years. I wasted a lot of time and a lot of reagents. 
I did learn molecular biology, and I combined that with my physics background in optics, and I tried to, to help optogenetics along the way in the early days. But what was the most important that I learned from Paul and his group as an undergrad was to focus on the process. To focus on the process, on the questions, and yes, try to work towards positive outcomes, work hard, not take re the resources and the trust for granted, but not define the quality of the scientist or identity of a scientist in terms of positive results or clear outcomes, because this is not what makes or breaks a scientist. So you will see PHP throughout the talk. This is what it means. It means Paul H. Patterson. Thank you, Paul. I wish I was a student today. I wish I was a graduate student year one today, because this is what you can use. You can ask so much more, and you can learn so much more because of the technological developments of people here in the audience over decades and worldwide, the worldwide scientific community. And from anatomical methods to whether find circuit tracing, connectivity through light sheet microscopy, or to try to modulate neurons, activate or inhibit them at will and with very high temporal precision. And this is a summary of just a few of the technologies that we've been trying to contribute to. And one very important fact that I want to highlight that for a first-year graduate student now might not even be common knowledge, was how um, straightforward some of the options were to use and how difficult some others were. And this was not necessarily intuitively, uh, intuitive at first. So as a reminder, the options that we use, channel rhodopsins and then the channels and the protein pumps, come from algae and bacteria. And interestingly enough, the channels coming from algae, upon delivering cofactors needed, there wasn't, it wasn't too hard to use them in mammals. However, the pumps encountered extreme difficulties. Early on, my first uh, PhD thesis project was to try to understand how deep brain stimulation works in Parkinson's by using inhibitory opsins to inhibit the, uh, the DBS site and try to understand the circuit elements that contribute to the release of uh, tremor and to improvement in outcomes. And what I learned early on was that the proton pumps, whether it's NPHR or halodopsin or ARCH or MAC, they had quite a bit of challenge in being expressed properly in mammalian cells. And reasons can be many, evolutionary distant species, but protein processing and trafficking ended up being a key reason. And here's what one would see when one expresses halorhodopsin long-term in vivo. There's aggregates in the cell, and you cannot use it to inhibit neurons too effectively. So as an early-stage graduate student, I saw this problem, and I thought, well, this is not my problem. My project is different. So I waited a while for somebody else to fix this for me. Uh, this didn't go too well, as expected, and uh, then I realized if I want to pursue with the project intended, I should give it a try in trying to fix it. Um, and it was a very interesting journey, and it was actually the beginning of my work as a protein engineer, and I took that work not only for opsins, but also for engineering viral vectors. The solution was rather interesting, because these proton pumps come from bacteria they do not know how to get outside the endoplasmic reticulum, so these aggregates here would overlap with ER markers. And later on, we figured out by putting ER export motifs how to get them outside of the ER, but they will be stuck in Golgi, and so on. After being unstuck from Golgi, we had to figure out how to put them to the plasma membrane. So it is very important for an effective opsin to be on the plasma membrane and not be in the cytosol for controlling excitability. And over the years, we figure out that you do need to help these opsins along the way. And this strategy was actually generalizable for many opsins. And what you see in the form of 
OPSIN 2.0 or 3.0, they all have ER export motifs to get out of the ER, and they have trafficking signals that enhance their membrane localization. And upon these modifications, they can be well tolerated in vivo long term, and they can be used to suppress neuronal activity in rodents. And here I'm showing you an example of a rat where we inhibit cholinergic neurons in the pedunculopontine nucleus. The pedunculopontine nucleus is an area of target for deep brain stimulation, and so is the subthalamic nucleus. So by using optogenetics after troubleshooting halorhodopsin, we were able to learn something very interesting, that the mechanism of action for deep brain stimulation of the subthalamic nucleus in Parkinson patients doesn't have to do only with the cell bodies at the electrode site. But importantly, the fibers, whether fibers synapsing into the STN or fibers of passage, also play a very significant role. So this was learning that optogenetics gave us about the DBS. It also showed that it's a very convenient site where by virtue of conversion of all of these fibers from cortex, you have a very convenient site to put the uh, deep brain stimulation electrode. However, after working on this problem for a while, and after moving at Caltech, which had a much broader biology division, and my colleagues would work on um, nematogenetics, zebrafish sleep, or gut microbiome, I started to think, I had to think about Parkinson in a broader context, and I became better educated about the significant symptoms that precede motor symptoms and circuits that are affected uh, in Parkinson patients that mediate sleep dysfunction and also gastric dysfunction. And these circuits also go beyond the brain and they affect the peripheral nervous system. And that was the reason why early in the lab, we embarked on a few dopamine and sleep projects that um, I will highlight briefly just to show how we use some of the technologies that we developed. The dopaminergic neurons in the dorsa raphae are a very interesting class. There is a small population because the raphae is known as being predominantly serotonergic. However, they do degenerate in multiple system atrophy and in Lewy body dementia. And both of these disorders are associated with long time, excessive daytime sleepiness. So there's an increased sleeping behavior if you have these neurons degenerating. So former graduate student Ryan Cho, in a series of reports, highlighted by using optogenetic and chemogenetic modalities, how these DRN dopamine neurons actually modulate arousal, and they can promote waking by salient stimuli. And this line of work caught the eye of my um, neighbor at Caltech, David Prober, and David Prober's lab has made contributions in terms of the genetics of sleep in the zebrafish. And uh, David and his scientists came to our group and said, well, we have this very significant delay in the sleep field, whether serotonin in the dorsal raphe promotes sleep or prevents sleep. And we wonder whether with all of the genetic tools that the field has created, whether we can address this both in uh, fish and in mice to try to understand this, this challenge. And the challenge was due to the fact that although serotonin is, has been long known to have a very important role in sleep, serotonin in the raphe, what's been rather controversial was that some experiments where the DRN serotonin cells are lesioned or where you inhibit serotonin, they resulted in reduced sleep, while at the same time, so this created the hypothesis that the dorsal raphe serotonin might be sleep promoting. However, the paradigm shifted once the community gained the ability to do single unit recordings, recording the cells in the raphe. And what was interesting was that these cells were wake active. So how can wake active cells, um, when inhibited, reduce sleep. So that was one challenge that we tried to, to work together in zebrafish and in rodents. And first, we were able, by using dif diphtheria toxin lesion, to replicate the uh, inhibition results, and also by using GCAMP imaging to confirm that indeed these serotonergic cells in the dorsal raphe are wake active. However, when we apply optogenetic excitation of different frequencies, the picture started to be interesting and also to make sense. 
tonic low frequency optogenetic activation of the RAFE turned out that it promotes sleep in mice. So former graduate student Michael Artermat did this very difficult surgeries. Those of you in the field, the few of you that do DRN surgeries know how difficult this is because it's right by the aqueduct and it's hard to have proper positioning and good survival of the, of the um, prep. So these difficult surgeries combine with EEG and EMG leads so you can label the, the sleep um, stages were used by Michael to show that when stimulated at three hertz tonic frequency, you do see a sleep behavior. So you have the channel rhodopsin cohorts and the control cohorts. However, when this stimulation instead is done at bursting high frequency, the effect is reversed. So bursting high frequency of the serotonergic neurons does induce wakefulness. So it does turn out the same cells, activation of the same cells can induce completely different behaviors. And this helped reconcile some of the, um, some of the, um, apparently at odds reports, but they were all reporting data about a complex circuit where genetics matter, activity matters, and the light day cycle for the rodent matters. Still the question remained, how can neurons that fire during wakefulness be sleep promoting? And this hypothesis was introduced long ago by Jouvet, and it goes to say that if you have wake active firing cells, they can actually build homeostatic sleep pressure. And after enough sleep pressure has been built, then the rodent goes into sleep and, and can rest. Um, and we've done as part of this paper, sleep deprivation experiments that confirm that. The key that I want to communicate from this study, beyond the, the results that we think are, are helpful, is, uh, is one of what technology can do in transgenic animal models. This is a project in fish and mice where we were able to use highly precise genetic modulation, temporal precise, combined with genetic transgenic lines in the fish. So in this report, I showed you only the rodent data, but the paper has a parallel path for the zebrafish. And the experiments do support each other in two very different species. And this was possible because of these genetic tools and the ability to work with transgenic animals. And this is wonderful. However, this is at odds and in great contrast to what we can do in the larger non-transgenic brain. We can do a lot and we can learn a lot from the transgenic mouse brain. However, as we try to go towards non-human and then human primate, there is a striking switch in the kind of questions we can ask in terms of uh, complex systems that have complex behaviors, and our lack of ability to, to experimentally probe the system. And that's because delivery of genes and photons to specific cell types in circuits are very big barriers in the large human or large primate non-transgenic brain. And this is one area that I want to focus most during this talk, because although we have the power of genetic tools, as activity modulators and also a readout for activity, there are difficulties in trying to use them in larger brains in a way that could enable preclinical and clinical translation. So I'll tell you about how we engineer systemic AAVs that can cross the blood-brain barrier and also high conductivity options that can match the needs for systemic delivery. And I will also mention some applications in neurodegeneration and neurodevelopment and a path forward maybe for translation. Broadly, for gene delivery, there are a few considerations. One would want to target both the central and the peripheral nervous system, and as well, in a way that's cell type specific or circuit specific, connectivity specific. And the retrograde AAV from Janilia and Berkeley comes to mind, a very, very powerful tool. In terms of routes of administration, we are used to direct injections, and more on this later, but there is a collection of methods through which one could access the central and the peripheral nervous system, whether it's direct organ targeting or using the cerebrospinal fluid path or by permeating the BBB with focused ultrasound. 
Some of these methods are needed as we go through different model organisms of interest. In the mouse, we have transgenesis, but as we span through the non-human primate brain, we do not have this ability. Fortunately, we are sitting on five decades of basic knowledge from the adeno-associated viral vector. From its discovery in 1965, to today, where we have approved gene therapies, where the AAV vector carries a functional product to children that have spinal muscular atrophy and increases the outcome and improves their lifespan, or to people that have vision loss. And this is reason for great hope and reason to try to focus and see how much we can use this modality to both understand the basic science and improve disease outcome. Six decades, or five to six decades, is a lot of work and a lot of progress has been made. However, when it comes to the central and the peripheral nervous system, our ability to deliver genes effectively across the blood-brain barrier or across large areas in a non-invasive manner is rather limited, and I'll show you how we are doing things in the lab now. So it's, we're very comfortable doing direct injections in transgenic animals. And what you obtain with spot injection is reduced spread. So the volume coverage is small, but that's not the only feature. At the injection site, you could have many copy numbers which could be toxic, could kill cells. GCAMP overexpression does that. But away from the injection site, you might have too little to be effective. And this is in the mouse brain. For applications that use light as a modality, and because of light scattering, you cannot recruit a large volume anyway, such as optogenetics, this is fine. However, if you try to recruit larger anatomical areas that sustain, let's say, behavior in a, in a primate brain, you do need to get a similar volume coverage. And this is for scale, from the mouse brain to the human brain. There are significant challenges with direct injections, because direct injection, diffusion rules don't change when you go from the small mouse brain to the large non-human primate brain. So what you have to do to cover the same effective volume is to do multiple insertions that could cause damage and could also result in non-uniform expression. So a key challenge that we've been focusing on for a decade now since I started my group at Caltech is the challenge of targeted genetic access to specific cell types and regions in the non-transgenic brain across the lifespan to take these genetic tools that we've been developing as a community and with support from the Brain Initiative and put them in um, the central nervous system of disease models. And this is a big challenge because in order to cross the blood-brain barrier, you need to understand the rules of crossing the blood-brain barrier. And when we started this work more than a decade ago, and still to date, what makes a substance cross the blood-brain barrier effectively, and what are the, all the knobs and, and mechanisms that one can use, it's still not fully understood. So when we started this work with incomplete biological knowledge, we were not able to design smart hypotheses that we could tackle in terms of how we could approach, cross, approach cl crossing the blood-brain barrier. So this is where actually the engineering background and learnings from other fields were greatly enabling because in other areas, one can make progress by not knowing all of the rules, but by having a very precise guided process that can prototype and take a tool that's good enough and make enough diversity and then put it through a selective pressure and see which one does better and then repeat. And then you put all of your hypotheses in how you design the stringency test. This takes the form of directed evolution, which is a method that my colleague at Caltech in chemistry and chemical engineering, Dr. Frances Arnold, invented, and she was awarded the Nobel Prize for it. So in directed evolution, you need a starting point that has the property that you want, but it's weak. It doesn't quite do the job that you need. Then you take that starting point, which in our case can be AV9. AV9 crosses the blood-brain barrier in neonates. It's the one used in humans for gene therapy for SMA. 
However, as the organism matures, AAV9 not only crosses weakly, but the tropism is mainly astrocytic. It's not too really efficient at targeting neurons. So then you take that parent, and by the rules of directed evolution, you generate diversity, and that diversity could be billions. And then you make libraries of offspring capsids that you then put through a stringent test of selection. In this case, you apply this library through the bloodstream of a rodent. And then you extract the tissue of interest, in this case the brain, and see, simply put, who made it through. Presented like this sounds simple, but the difficulty here is to raise above the biological noise. You have to filter to millions and millions of possibilities to end up only with a handful that can cross. And the subtleties and the stringencies of this test were figured out by former lab member Ben Deverman that now leads his own group at the Broad. And by using directed evolution in an iterative fashion, one could take AV9 from a serotype that doesn't cross the adult BBB effectively, and engineering the surface capsid, the variable regions on the AV capsid, you can now have very efficient transduction of the brain. And as good engineers, we made sure that we improved the efficiency, and you have here a highly efficient one with um, would load those as well. And when you perform these screenings, you get what you're looking for. But if you look broadly enough, you also get serendipitous results, such as the sensory peripheral vector, PHPS, that I'll show you how we use it in a Parkinson project in the periphery later. Because we only modify the capsid of the AAV, the shell, the experimenter has full control on what's packaged. And one can use systemic delivery, either tail vein or retroorbital, to reach difficult areas, either surgically, so I mentioned the dorsa rafe, how hard it is to target because of the aqueduct. You can genetically label the dorsa rafe without any invasiveness. In this case, in a transgenic animal, you see the expression in the dopaminergic cells. And, uh, and also the serotonergic cells. So in the dopaminergic cells in the midbrain, that's a relevant area for Parkinson. And also, you can use this to screen gene regulatory elements. What I'm showing here in red is the inhibitory neuron profile when one packages a DLX enhancer. Um, and the DLX enhancer was reported by Vicasso Hall and also Gord Fischel. So we, we use the sequences reported in the literature and packaged in the systemic vector. And the advantage is that with one injection, you get the full brain profile. You don't have to do individual injections per different brain areas. And to fast forward, you can package libraries of such enhancers and find the profiles. And there's work from the Allen Institute showing how you can mine through libraries of enhancers and obtain the brain-wide profile. In addition, you can package multiple genes in a way that allows morphological reconstruction in clear tissue. And you can target either neuronal or non-neuronal cells. So here you can see with systemic delivery through a two-vector method that's described in this paper from former graduate student Ken Chan, you can control the density of labeling for the brain area of interest. So what I'm showing you is all labeling, and the work concerns whether the multiplicity of infection that you get with systemic delivery is enough to actually get physiological results. Unlike direct injection that gets a lot of copies in the cells, systemic delivery has low multiplicity of infection. So there were concerns that maybe we won't make enough protein for optogenetics or chemogenetics. For chemogenetics, because there's an amplification step, fortunately, you can see here a proof of concept of non-invasive control. The result is not new. If you activate midbrain dopaminergic neurons, you get hyperlocomoting mammals. What's new about this result is that you can do this cell type specific activation in a completely non-invasive way. Because the gene is delivered through this vector that crosses the blood-brain barrier, and also the chemical gate, CNO or compound 21, crosses the blood-brain barrier. So you can deliver the gene and the chemical gate through the blood-brain barrier. And in doing so, we can obtain a highly localized modification in a way that doesn't require invasive surgery. 
However, I showed you in the case of uh, dorsal roughest erotologic project, how important it is to have good control over the activity. Uh, very precise frequencies can cause very different behavioral outcomes. So we were motivated to make optogenetics work with systemic delivery as well. And early on, we learned that conventional child rhodopsins did not have enough conductivity to match well with systemic vectors. Fortunately, we were able to apply the same principles of directed evolution to the problem of engineering opsins with desired properties, whether they were higher conductivity or altered light spectra, different colors to different wavelengths. However, a key difficulty, and I mentioned briefly for trainees in the audience, is when you pair two modalities that have very different scales in readout. Directed evolution is extremely high throughput. In the AEV, we would use NGS as a readout, and that's also high throughput. However, for channel rhodopsins, your readout is wall cell patch clamping. You need to measure the currents with electrophysiology to see if you got anything better or not. And this is extremely low throughput. So taking these modalities, high throughput of directed evolution, with low throughput of patching, single cell patching, was a very big gap to bridge. And fortunately, former graduate student Claire Bedbrook, co-advised with Frances Arnold, managed to bridge this gap by introducing machine learning. And the way she did that, she filtered through libraries of opsins, first for the good localizer. She developed a spy tag catcher covalent modality for labeling only the membrane fraction of the opsin. Then she dropped anybody that didn't localize to the membrane. And then from the remaining set, patched only a, a, a fraction, let's say 10%. And based on that 10% electrophysiology, slow um, acquiring data, she predicted by using data uh, analysis, she predicted on the dark space. And from the dark space of the remaining, let's say 90%, handpicked capsids that would perform differently. And this method resulted in opsins that have a much, much higher photocurrent. And with direct intracranial injection, any of this photocurrent is enough for uh, causing action potentials. However, with systemic delivery, you do need higher fluxing opsins in order to to modulate the desired tissue volume. So then Claire worked with former postdoctoral fellow, uh, Elliot Robinson, that now leads his own group, to obtain proof of concept of non-invasive or minimally invasive optogenetic modulation with systemic AAVs and high conductivity opsins. And the way they did that was to deliver the chargers, the modified opsins, with a systemic AAV. And you can see here the profile without surgery. And then only by thinning the skull applying the fiber optic without damaging the skull, without perfor perforating dura and exposing the, the brain. And this was sufficient, so completely non-invasive, it was su sufficient to modulate locomotion in rodents. And extrapolating for larger brains, this can have some utility, because with higher fluxing opsins and systemically delivered vectors, you can now capture a larger brain area. And as we go to non-human primates or primates, you do need that larger volume that mediates certain behaviors of interest. When developing these vectors, uh, we've used some of them with our group and some with collaborators. And the profiles of the vectors, some could be used for neuroscience applications within brain research, but some had very interesting profiles in the periphery. For example, in the DRGs for pain sensation or in the gut for gut motility. And the gut was of particular interest for the very simple reason that in Parkinson patients, there's strong gastric symptomology that many times precede the, precedes the motor symptoms. And also because there's been pathology found in the gut of PD patients. And fortunately, my neighbor at Caltech at the time, Sarkis Masmanian, was conducting quite a few experiments on the gut and PD. And we teamed up to try to understand more about this gut-to-brain hypothesis in Parkinson. And former postdoctoral fellow Colin Callis decided to conduct this experiment where he would seed the gut of healthy adult mice with preformed fibers of alpha-synuclein, and then ask what happens to the gut short-term and long-term, and what happens to the brain.
and much to Colin's frustration because the paradigm he, sh he chose was a low amount of seeding of preformed fibers in selected places in the duodenum. These mice would show a short-term disturbance to the gut, but with no long-term effects and no changes into the brain. And this was apparently at odds with paradigms that use a lot of preformed uh, fiber seeding that causes gut pathology and that's long-lasting and then crosses to the brain. So then Colin thought, what might account for the differences? And he had a very um, good idea prompted by the fact that PD is a highly heterogeneous disorder. And there's many factors. There's genetics, there's environmental. Aging is also a strong risk factor. So then what Colin did was to add cohort, cohorts of aged mice to the, the project and also cohorts of mice that were genetically modified to overexpress alpha-synuclein, so genetic predisposition or aging, as an additional risk factor for developing synucleopathies or PD-type PD dysfunction. And what was really interesting was the stark contrast between the results you would get when the seeding was done in healthy adult mice versus the seeding done in aged mice or mice that had the genetic predisposition for synucleopathies. And there was a, a very significant effect in the latter groups. And Colin went to do a molecular profile to try to understand what's happening in these animals. Why are the healthy adult ones so much more resistant to long-term injury while the other cohorts were not? And he narrowed it down to a collection of lysosomal enzymes. And I'm showing you just one result here. And I want to highlight for the... Uh, young trainees, that this project was set up to take a, a circuit optogenetic, chemogenetic type approach. But then the reality of the data showed us a path that we didn't necessarily envision ourselves taking, but the data was speaking too strongly to not follow through. And what Colin found was that the G-case was downregulated from the wild type healthy adults in the age cohort or the alpha synuclein overexpressing mice. And the reason this is important is that G case is encoded by GBA that when mutated causes Gaucher disease, and mutations in GBA are also a risk factor for Parkinson's. This downregulation in G case inversely correlated with the outcome when Colin would see this mice with preformed fibros. So this together informed a gene rescue experiment where Colin reasoned that he could use the systemic delivery vectors, the ones focused on the enteric nervous system. And by using the systemic delivery vectors, he could put back the delta G case that's missing in the age cohort or missing in the genetically modified cohort. And you can see here the replacement of G case from the wild type to the ASO and with systemic vectors back to the wild type level. When this rescue was performed, um, the physiology rescue also follows. So there was significant, although at times partial rescue, from the deficits of inducing gut injury with preformed fibros. And this is detailed in the paper, but this project, if anything, created even more questions and limitations from the technology developing perspective. Because what became obvious as we stepped outside the brain and we looked at the rest of the body, including the gut, was that these systemic vectors are going to have a biodistribution pattern that at times could cause side effects or could complicate mechanistic understanding. And we must be able to understand the biodistribution in vivo and in vitro in order to design the vectors that match the problem. And for this, we teamed up with a group of Cathy Ferrara at Stanford. She runs a PET imaging lab. And together with her chemists, we decorated the AAV capsids with PET labels. And we were able to follow real time from injection the distribution of parent capsids, such as AAV9. And you see very little retention in the brain, even a day after injection, compared to the retention in the brain of engineered PHPEB. However, what's obvious and also jumps at you, it's that in addition to the strong brain retention, you have significant liver expression. 
And this can be a problem because of liver toxicity. And he also highlighted the fact that although PET gives very good real-time data, it doesn't give us the high resolution and the cellular phenotyping that's needed in order to improve the delivery vectors in a way that's specific. So then we resorted to another method that the lab published on quite early when we started. And this was a result um, that came in a way serendipitously. Um, I was involved in the early team that led to Clarity, and one of the difficulties of the Clarity method was the slowness and the, um, in, especially in targeting very thick and large organs. So then, when I started the group, and also thinking about the brain to periphery connection, we tried to think of methods by which we could improve that. And um, amazing work from a technician in the lab at the time, Bin Yang, and since then graduated from Caltech with Dr. David Anderson and pursuing his doctoral studies. Bin had the idea to use the transcardial perfusion route to flush modified clarity reagents, and what we ended up with was a transparent mouse. We were not looking for a transparent mouse, and that was a surprise. And when we saw it, we thought, oh, what a cute, but maybe rather not useful result. <laughs> and we pursued it, though, and we published on it, and we realized as we were developing our systemic AAV libraries that this was actually a wonderful solution to show us a way to do biodistribution with high precision, high resolution, and molecular profiling in the libraries. In a way that now when you deliver your library systemically, you can clear the entire mouse and you can look at all of the organs from the brain to the pancreas, and then you can indeed see that engineer vectors might be retained very strongly in the brain, but there's still very strong expression in the liver or the heart, both areas that could cause complications. And this was a reinforcer that we must go back to our selection methods and ask harder questions, ask for vectors that not only would cross the blood-brain barrier and transduce the brain, but vectors that can stay clear of the liver or stay clear of the DR to minimize the risk of side effects and also to not absorb virus away from intended areas. And the way we did that was by performing multiplex screening. So rather than only using one transgenic line, you can do the selections in Cree animals that have Cree in different cell types or different organs. And the key to raise above the noise, and this is something that Ben Deverman introduced, was to have Cree recombinase as your stringency gate. Because because you can only read, so what you do, you modify the capsid, you package the modification within the modified capsid, and then you design your primer so you can only read out the ones that crossed the blood-brain barrier, got into a Cree-positive cell, made it to the nucleus, gets the single-stranded DNA double-stranded because Cree would only act on double-stranded DNA flips it, and then you can extract it in your, with your primers, and you can read it out. You can read out the modification that allowed for that property. So now what one can do is to look at these data sets across cell types and across organs and emerge with patterns. And I'm going to summarize 10 years of work on the AV capsid where we took it from the AV9 parent and by modifying one variable region. And when I say one, the AV has repeat, so it's actually 60. We modify one side, but the repetition makes quite a, quite a few loops um, in addition on the AV9. And you have very poor expression in the adult mouse brain, but very strong expression in the liver. And then with the PHPEB, when where one loop is modified, you get strong brain retention, but you still have expression in the liver. Since then, we figured out how to modify other variable regions. It's not easy because even one amino acid change can collapse the capsid. So we had to figure out safe ways to modify additional regions on the AV capsid in a way that would create diversity that we can also produce and test. And with two variable regions, which would be 120 modifications, you can have a situation where you can retain the expression in the brain and have hardly any expression in the liver. 
And this was a, a very encouraging result that showed us that you have a lot of flexibility in what you ask and what these vectors can do. And at around the same time, we published our work, put it on Agin, and shared with anybody that uh, asked for it, something interesting emerged. When these vectors are applied across trains, so interested collaborators would want to apply them in animal models of disease. And these animal models of disease would be on mixed backgrounds and mixed strains. And then we got, within our lab and with collaborators, this collection of behaviors of engineered capsids across strains and across species. And it became apparent that the strongest performance is in C57. And this is not surprising. The selection is in C57. And as Francis says, you get what you select for. You get very strong performance in the system you select. And there's OK performance in other lines, like FPB or 129. But there are some strains, such as Bob C, that are completely resistant to PHPB crossing. From a basic science perspective, this is um, one exciting because it can help you work out the mechanism. And this indeed happened. Three independent groups, including uh, the group of Ben Deverman, published that the receptor for PHPEB is Ly6A. And Ly6A, you have it in C57, you don't have it in Bulb C. So very exciting to be able to work out the mechanism. However, this slide, and if you take nothing from the talk, I would hope you, you remember this, is also very concerning because these are all highly inbred strains of laboratory mice. They're all mice. And you see very different patterns across strains. And I do think that us here in this auditorium, a few thousands of us, we have much more genetic diversity because of our biological variables than these mice that I'm showing on the slide. Because gene therapy is happening, because clinical trials are being designed and re-enrollment is ongoing, this shows that it really matters how we enroll in these clinical trials and how we create re research agents and clinical reagents to serve all. And I do not want to let you with a pessimistic view, because if you're aware of the problem and you confront it head on, there are solutions. So what I'm showing you here is work from former graduate student Priya Kumar. She engineered the AV backbone, focusing on bypassing previously resistant strains. And you can see here that bulb C, a strain previously resistant to PHPB type molecules, you can design solutions. And of course, the efficiency is not that high yet, but this is a perfect um, path for directed evolution in terms of improving efficiency. The same approach to try to achieve good performance in different strains with mechanistic information and changing the experimental paradigm with knowledge from our group and collaborators allowed us to slowly and systematically cross the blood-brain barrier in different strains of mice and then rats and also in non-human primates. For non-human primates, the uh, first result I show is from the marmoset, which is a new uh, world monkey. Not as closely related to us as the macaque is. I'll show you that later. But you can see here brain-wide distribution with a systemic engineered AV that's presented here in a, in a recent report. And what we noticed while profiling these vectors is that not only they can cross the blood-brain barrier, but they can have very interesting tropes where one capsid could have a neuronal bias, and you see it here in the form of cap B10, while others can capture both neurons and astrocytes. And this was very encouraging because it showed us that if we mine the results of directed evolution with the goal of now, rather than being organ-specific or crossing different biological barriers with the goal of having cell tropes, one can obtain that. And I'm showing you here the extent of these data sets and the analysis is quite involved, but what you can get is clusters. You can get clusters of AV vectors based on their modification and their tropes performance. And these clusters are highly informative in giving us candidates that could have cell type tropes. And maybe this is one of my favorite experimental results, because what you're looking at 
is three capsids packaging the same cargo, um, fluorescent, green fluorescent protein, under a ubiquitous promoter, under CAG. And the difference in morphology that you see here is all due to the capsid and not to the animal or to the cargo. And this points to a situation where we can look at different engineer capsids across libraries in the field now, and there's a very active area of research in academia and industry to diversify these AAV capsids for different applications. And you can pull them and look at their profile in situ. So this is RNA detection work from postdoctoral candidate Min Jiang, Min Ji Jiang, and she had a talk earlier in the morning as well, and she is on the job market. So Min, pulled AAVs and can look across different capsids, and at the same time can look at endogenous profiles. So you can look at the cell typing and at the AV profile. And then you can start to generate a lookup table of capsids with different tropes. Why is this so important? There are benefits of tropic capsids. In addition to, to the ones I mentioned, the AEV weakness, a major weakness, is a very limited size. And this limited size actually doesn't allow us to pack enough genetic material. If you move the tropism on the capsid, you do not need lengthy gene regulatory elements within the capsid. And when you don't need those gene regulatory elements, you can have more functional cargo. That's one reason. In addition to reasons of increased safety and lowering the dosage. Beyond CNS, um, the directed evolution approach also generated better peripheral nervous system variants, and they're described in this report from graduate student Xing Hong Chen and former graduate student Priya Kumar, where you have PNS1 and PNS2 that have strong expression in the nodos and the DRG with some liver detargeting as well. And we are very excited about the possibility of combining capsids for their strengths for more complex disorders. And I'm just gonna show you just a brief unpublished result for, from a graduate student, MD-PhD student, Acacia Hori. She is clinically oriented and interested in understanding and improving the outcome for Friedrich's ataxia patients. And used an approach to try to deliver the missing fretoxin, so it's a loss of function, and conveniently, the gene can be packaged within an AAV. And the clinical manifestation has both central and peripheral components. So what Akisha did was to look through the toolbox of systemic vectors that were engineered and choose the strongest one for the CNS and also the strongest one for cardiac or DRG profile, while at the same time trying to detarget the liver. And she settled on CAP-B10 and PNS2 and used this capsid in an inducible fretaxin knockdown described in this report. And then Acacia delivered this combination capsid to the rodents and ran a motor behavioral um, package. And while doing that, also kept them ice and could confirm that indeed the fretaxin was rescued in areas that were of pathophysiologic interest. So there are gene regulatory elements that ensure that the expression is the, is the level that's needed in the organs that's needed. And what was very exciting to see was that indeed with this combination capsid, you can rescue the motor behavior in a beam walk. So you see here a narrowing beam assay with the wild type moving smoothly while the control has some difficulty. And the, um, so this is the AV frotaxin. And with rescue, you can see a much better walking from the frotaxin replacement versus the diseased animal. And you have here the, the actual statistics for the animals. But how can we take this mouse experiment? And many say we've cured so many mice, and that's true, and that's sad when it's said, because yes, we cure mice all the time. And we have to remember that there's quite a distance between mice and, and humans. And how can we make these preclinical results? How can we bridge the, the gap or the, the value of that? And of course, uh, testing, developing reagents and testing them in systems that are closely biologic, as closely related as, as possible, it's necessary. And in the last part, in the 
last slides of the talk, I want to highlight that, again, there is hope. It takes time, it's difficult, it's error-prone, it's expensive. But with encouragement, and here I have to credit Drew Fox that found me at our poster at SFN many, many years ago, and he said, Viviana, we saw your EB paper, and we must do the same for macaques. And I said, Drew, this is impossible. We cannot do it. And Drew did not accept a no, and we've embarked on a very long and very difficult and very intense collaboration that allowed us to now cross the blood-brain barrier in the neonate macaque. And you see here um, delivery of of fluorescent proteins across the blood-brain barrier. And to appreciate the extent of coverage, it's hard to show it in a picture, but I'm showing you walkthroughs, uh, clear volumes of marmoset brain and macaque brain delivering um, multiplex genes that can show good coverage. So indeed there is um, hope that we can have these capsules match the needs of basic research and also of therapies. And all of the reagents that I mentioned um, are available on Agene for mice, marmosets, and macaques. Um, they're described in this recent review, on a review of neuroscience, and also the methods in the nature protocols, how to make and how to use them. And what I'm most excited about going forward is everything I showed you was the result of being sidetracked. I always really, really tried hard to do basic science and hypothesis-driven research. And whenever I tried to do that, I encountered technological barriers, and because I was an engineer before, and it came naturally to fix problems. So I turned into a problem fixer. And I keep trying to do basic research, and I hope that at some point I'll be allowed to do that. And what I'm very excited about is to put engineering to work in service of basic biology. And there's two ways in which we're doing this. I already mentioned that by looking at the performance of engineered AVs, we can learn about the BBB heterogeneity, and that's one. And the second one, now the community has thousands of interesting flavors of AAVs that have interesting behaviors in a way that unlocks mechanisms, biological mechanisms. So if you have AAVs that cross the blood-brain barrier, they are using an endogenous mechanism that's maybe not yet known to us. So what we are doing, we are de-orphanizing these AAVs and finding their receptors. And by this means, we can understand the rules of getting across biological barriers and of getting across cell types. And we can populate this biological knowledge. So I'm excited to finally start doing some basic research, and hopefully we can do this for a while. And I'm very grateful to my uh, lab members, um, very hardworking, very dedicated, and sticking with, with difficult problems in a way as Paul taught me. Some might work, some might not, but if you do not love the doing of it, then it's, it's hard. It's hard to do science. And on the flip side, if you have enough projects and a good environment that can energize one and can generate very, very interesting um, and fun and fun work. So uh, funding sources, recent PI alumni that are hiring for the labs, and I will leave you with this um, final wish uh, for the, the community that we could jointly now take these genetic tools that are coming from the Brain Initiative and target them in a way that's relevant for the research questions that we have and for the clinical problems that we have. And maybe slowly trying to inch our way in towards um, circuit therapies for neurological and neuropsychiatric indications. I'm a basic scientist, not an MD, so this will be a problem that um, I can contribute tools, but it takes a lot of collaboration and, and focus to, to bridge from the ops in to nervous system disorders. So thank you, and looking forward to questions. Thank you so much, Viviana. This has been absolutely a fascinating talk. We have received uh, many questions. I am uh, going to limit myself to three questions, which sort of regroup some of the questions that people have been asking. So there were several questions regarding the delivery mode. Is, for example, intranasal, is that an option? IP, or 
you mentioned the uh, blood-brain barrier that can be permeated with uh, focal ultrasound. H how do you see which is going to be the ones that are going to be the most interesting for clinical applications? I think it depends on the goal. So intranasal is an interesting one if you want to target the lung, for example, or maybe if you want to target the olfactory bulb. And IP for more local gastric connectivity. What I showed, everything that I showed is through the IV route that can be retroorbital or tail vein. But IV is not for everything. So, and I didn't emphasize the difficulties of IV. You need a large volume and there could be side effects. So I think what we need to do is to keep all of the delivery methods in mind and match them with the application. And there's no one wins it all. It's really customized and it needs to, to serve the goal. Related to that, there was a question regarding the possibility of in utero genetic uh, treatment. How would that work? And is there any risk that the AEVs would cross the placental barrier? <laughs> what I can say is that we've actually tried to cross the placenta and failed enthusiastically many years. So it seems that it's not a risk, although it might be at times a wish for neurodevelopmental disorders that develop in utero. And postpartum, maybe the circuit is too advanced in its miswiring. There might be a need to deliver genes in utero to understand neurodevelopmental disorders. And that's been hard, so we've been trying to do that, and the placenta is extremely protective of the embryo because it's a harder problem than the blood-brain barrier where there's one layer. The placenta have multiple barriers of protection. So I would say in terms of concerns, doesn't seem to be, but on the other side, you might want that if you could detarget the tissue of the dam. And Given what you told us about the sensitivity of the different mouse uh, lines and strains, is there any need to customize these therapies for people? One would hope that you don't need individual customization, but you would need to take into account the genetic background, and we might need to form groups that have similarities that are informed by the mechanism of action of the AVs. Because by knowing the mechanism of action, you could then sequence and make informed decisions for enrollment. And this is, I can't emphasize how important this is, because if you include somebody that doesn't have the right mechanism of action, you could trigger neutralizing antibodies and disqualify that individual from therapies that might work in the future. And last but not least, what's your prediction? Which is the disease that is going to be first targeted with approaches that you described? I think where we see the most progress is early life stage neurodevelopmental disorders. And we've seen muscle disorders, also blood disorders. So I think early life stage and then later life stage neurodegeneration. Okay, with this optimistic statement, thank you so much. It's really been transformative.